الخامس عن أم المؤمنين أم عبد الله عائشة رضي الله عنها قالت قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من أحدث في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد رواه البخاري ومسلم وفي رواية لمسلم من عمل عملا ليس عليه أمرنا فهو رد the mother of the believers, Umm um Abdullah Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, said, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, anyone who innovates into this affair of ours, something that is not from it, shall be rejected, collected by Bukhari and Muslim. And a version by Muslim says, whoever does a deed to which we have not given approval, it shall be rejected. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إله الأولين والآخرين وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا إلى الخير محمد عبد الله ورسوله النبي الأمين الهادي إلى صراط مستقيم اللهم صل عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد الحمد لله we are on the fifth hadith now and uh, with the grace of Allah we have discussed about the first four hadith and their importance and also their um, brief explanation now it's been two weeks Nah, it's been two weeks now, but inshallah, um, instead of me asking you uh, one question, what we did last week or two weeks ago, we will inshallah get started with the hadith straight away. Hadith number five that Imam Al Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala um, collected or mentioned in his uh, blessed uh, collection of 40 hadith is Hadith Aisha. Aisha radiallahu anha bint Abi Bakr al Siddiq, the daughter of Al Siddiq. She is been called, one of her name or her nickname is as siddiqa as siddiqa bintu as siddiqa As you all know, Aisha radiallahu anha had no kids from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And yet, Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah, when he mentioned, he said, An Ummi Abdullah, the mother of Abdullah. My question, why? Why is she been nicknamed the mother of Abdullah? Knowing that she has no kid called Abdullah. She had no kid at all from the Prophet Sallallahu Why is she being called mother of Abdullah? Umm Abdullah. It's a kunya. Hmm? It's a kunya. It's a kunya. It's kunya. But this, this kunya means something. She, he said it's a kunya. Kunya means it's like the Arab they used to call themselves, they have a nickname by saying Abu so and so, father of so and so, mother of so and so. That's a possibility, but there's another better explanation, and that is Aisha radiallahu anha, like any wife of the Prophet وسلم, they are the mother of all believers. They are the mother of all believers. All the wives of our, our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they are our mothers. قال الله عز وجل النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم وأزواجه أمهاتهم the Prophet وسلم, they are the, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, uh, the, he has the most right upon the believers and his wives, the wives of the Prophet وسلم, are their mothers. That is why she was nicknamed the mother of Abdullah. Now the hadith is one of the most important hadith. I don't know if you remember in the first hadith that was collected and authored by Imam al-Nawawi and that is, what is the first hadith that Imam al-Nawawi mentioned? Now. That's the second hadith. Ahsant. That's the second hadith. What about the first one? Aywa hadithun niya. The action are but by the intention, or the action are accepted only by the intention. We mentioned then that the scholars they kind of summarize Islam into a number of hadith. We have mentioned then. We said that some of the scholars, Abu Hanifa, he said, Radiallahu anhu wa rahimahullah. Islam evolved and talk about four hadith. Imam Ahmad he say Islam talk about three hadith. Imam Shafi'i he say Islam talk about four hadith. And one of the four and three hadith that the scholars of Islam mention is this hadith. Hadith Man ahdatha amri fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fahuwa rad wa fi riwaya li muslim Man 
amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa rad the hadith niya is a mizan fi fi al a'mal al batina which means that the hadith niya is a standard on how to know whether your um, inward act or your spiritual act done by the heart are accepted through niya you have to have a sincere intention Hadith Aisha is a standard for outward actions. Any deed that you do outwardly, publicly, must be done in accordance to the Sharia, in accordance to the Islamic legislation. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Man Whoever innovate something that he, that he thinks to be part of our religion. Amrina means part of our affairs, our matter. And what matters to us, to us all the most? Is it our money? Is our money matters to us the most? No, no it's our religion. Our religion is the thing that will save you from hellfire. Is the thing that will take you to Jannah. Tamam? Is the thing that all of us will be questioned about. One of the three questions that we will be questioned when we will all be buried. The first one is Mar Rabbuk, who is your Lord. The second one, Man Nabiyuk. And who, is your, your, who was your prophet that was sent to you? The third question, Madinuk. What is your religion? What is the religion that you were following? That is why, <coughs> here what we talked about, fi amrina, in our matter, in our affair, what, we meant, what the Prophet meant here, as the scholars have mentioned, is the religion. So any deed done and added into religion that is not part of it, is rejected. Allah rejected. Allah does not accept it. Why? Because Allah Azza wa Jal sent the book. And Allah Azza wa Jal sent our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a prophet and as a messenger. Messenger means as a teacher. He taught the way to worship Allah. <coughs> like Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu used to say, he used to say that everything that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam taught, he taught us with a purpose. And he said this famous statement, Naam. He said that ما ترك شيئا ما ترك النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم شيئا من خير إلا دل أمته على ما هو عليه وما ترك شيئا من شر إلا وأنذر أو وحذر أمته على ما هو عليه. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم everything in this religion our Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has made it clear. If it's good, he would you know clarify it to us and he said do it do this action this is good. If it's bad, then he would uh, warn us against it. <coughs> and uh, that is why this color, they say that it is important that we follow the uh, religion. And the way to follow the religion is of two things. By looking at the Quran, and the Quran, it is one of the main references in our religion. And the second one is by learning and understanding the hadith by learning and understanding the hadith and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on many occasions and one of them hadith will come later as ibn rajab said he said that this hadith will be talked and will be discussed in details in hadith number 28 hadith al-irbad ibn sariya man ya'ish minkum min ba'di fa sayar ikhtilafan kathira fa alaykum bi sunnati that is why inshallah this hadith we will probably leave it until we uh, talk uh, and we explain uh, the hadith number 28 but in short this is one of the most important hadith this is the standard for your action to find out whether your action will be accepted by Allah just look at your action okay is my action in accordance to the sunnah is my action in um, uh, is it accordance to the Quran if so, Alhamdulillah, your action will be accepted, of course, with sincere intention. But if you do an action that is not mentioned nor in the Quran and nor in the Sunnah, then it is rejected by Allah and it is not accepted. Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned here why the scholars and the narrators of hadith, they mentioned the two narration. One narration, man ahdatha fi amrina. Whoever innovate in our religion, that is not part of it. And the other narration, whoever does an action that is not part of it. Because if you 
ignore the second narration, which is whoever does, whoever does, then this means that if you do an action initially that was part of the religion, but it was not done by the Prophet, you can still do it. This is the explanation of Mafum al riwayat al ula Mafum means this is how it is understood. But the second narration clarifies it. No, even in action that is not done by our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is rejected. And there are many examples at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the example of the three men. One of the three men, they came to one of his wives and they knock on their door uh, and then say, is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa at home? And his wife, I think it was Umm Salama radiallahu anha, she said, no, the Prophet Islam is not at home. And then they say, okay, we come from far away. We come from far away and we want to ask him a few questions. But we have a question regarding how does he behave in the, in the house. And then Umm Salama, she was telling them, okay, he was like any other husband and he was like a worshiper, like any other man. And then they taqalu ka'annama taqalu as if they undermine their own action and they undermine their say, this is our prophet he does so little so who are we we will never reach his level one of them he said I will fast every single day for my whole life I will not break I will not uh, basically uh, break one day basically I will fast every day and of course in the night he, he breaks but he will fast every day another man he say I will never sleep in the night I will spend all my night in prayer and never sleep ever and the third man he said I will never get married and then they went they went to the masjid and Prophet Aslam went to his wife and Umm Salama told him, okay, these three people came from far away and they wanted to meet you and they asked me about you and I told them, you're like any other husband, any other man, you know, at home you help us, you sleep, you... And then they, they undermined their action, they felt like, okay, subhanAllah, this is our Prophet and we do nothing compared to him. And then Prophet Aslam got a bit angry, he went to the masjid and said, who are those three who ask about me? I said, don't you know, Ala ta'alamun annani akhshakum lillahi wa atqakum lah? Don't you know that I'm the most fearful man and the most pious man among you all? Say, Amma ana fa'asumu wa uftir. As for me, I fast some days and I eat some other days. I don't fast all year long. Wa anamu wa usalli. And I spend some night in prayer and I sleep some night as well. وَأَتَزَوَّجُ النِّسَاءِ And I do get married. فَمَنْ رَغِبَ سُنْ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Whoever is trying to take a path other than my sunnah is not part of me. He's not from me. He's not from my religion. <coughs> so this hadith shows that look at these three people. Is fasting a bid'ah? Is fasting an innovation in religion? No. no, it's part of the religion. It's part of it. Is praying in the night part of the religion? Yeah. It's part of the religion. But yet the Prophet said, whoever does in a particular way that the Prophet never did to a point that will, you will overburden yourself, this is not part of the religion. And this is why the hadith, the second narration, explains and clarifies, man amila, whoever does an action that is not part of our religion, then it is rejected. And now Allah will not look at them. Don't overburden yourself. Follow the path of our Prophet ﷺ. That is why we have so many statements. It is too short to mention today. So many statements from the Salaf. Like Imam al-Shafi'i. Like Imam Ahmed. Like Imam Malik. Like Imam Abu Hanifa. Like Imam al-Awza'i. Like Imam Abdurrahman ibn Mahdi. Saying about, you know, Alayka bi bil athar Alayka bi tariq al-Nabi sallam even if the people they come up with the, the beautif uh, they beautify their speech and they try to come up with their argument as long as they don't have qala Allah, qala Rasul then don't worship Allah with their argument with their, with their rational the way that we should worship Allah is through our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he is the best worshipper he is the most Righteous man on, that walked on earth. We should follow his path, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the uh, muqtada. Muqtada means this is the result of your shahada. 
ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, which means to be sincere in your niyyah, to do all your deeds for Allah and Allah alone. Wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah means that you testify that the Muhammad is the message of Allah. Why do you testify that? So that you follow his path. Do exactly as he did. Tamam? And do not innovate and do not come something, do not bring something new in the religion. We will inshallah discuss in more detail in hadith number 28, hadith Irbad ibn Sariya. Tafadl hadith al sadis Hadith Nu'man ibn Bashir. في انجليزي ولا ما في؟ يلا تفضل ما ما تفضل. This is hadith number six narrated by Numan ibn Bashir. May Allah be pleased with them both. He said, I heard Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, okay, and then it brings the Arabic, Inna al halala bayyinun wa inna al harama bayyinun wa baynahuma mushtabihatun la ya'lamuhunna kathirun minan nas faman ittaqa al mushtabahat istabra al dinihi wa irdihi wa man waqa'a fil mushf في الشبهات وقع في الحرام كالراعي يرعى حول الحما يوشك أن 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 يرتع فيه ألا إن لكل ملك حما ألا وإن حما الله محارمه ألا وإن للجسد مضغة وإن في المضغة ألا وإن في الجسد مضغة إذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله وإذا فسدت فسد الجسد كله ألا وهي القلب so the hadith in English, certainly that which is lawful is clear and that which is unlawful is clear but between them both are ambiguous matters not known by many of the people. So whoever refrains from the ambiguous matters has protected his religion and honor. But anyone who gets into the ambiguous matters soon gets caught in the unlawful ones, like the shepherd who pastures around the sanctuary. He soon grazes into it. Every sovereign has his sanctuary, and certainly Allah's sanctuaries are his prohibitions. And then verily, the body has a morsel of flesh. When it is upright, all of the body is upright. And when it is corrupted, all of the body is corrupted. And that is the heart collected by Bukhari and Muslim. This is hadith of the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir. Nu'man ibn Bashir is one of the youngest Sahabi. His father, Bashir ibn Sa'ad al-Ansari, he was also a father. There's a discussion in between the scholars whether Nu'man ibn Bashir actually heard this hadith from Rasulullah because Nu'man ibn Bashir, when the Prophet died, he was only seven years old. Radiallahu anhu wa an abi. So this teaches us something. I don't know if I, I went over last time. This teaches us that as sahaba kulluhum udul. As sahaba, they're all udul. Udul means they're all trustworthy. They don't need to mention, I heard from another sahabi that the Prophet said. If they say, Qala Rasulullah, as long as they are companion, even if they saw Rasulullah just once, a young boy, then that is enough. We accept his statement. But a tabi'i, what means a tabi'i? The one who, the student of the companion? Uh, the one who came after the Prophet I mean, after the death of the Prophet <laughs> Or he was alive during the time of the Prophet Muhammad but he never met him. If they say Tabi'i, مثلا Hassan al-Basri رضي الله عنه ورحمه He said, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Is it possible for Hassan al-Basri to narrate directly from Rasul Allah? Is it possible? No. It's not possible. Because he never saw the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Do we accept his statement? No. Huh? No. We don't. Until the scholars, they investigate. They say, okay, is this maybe there's a uh, اتصال, اتصال, maybe there's a connection somewhere. We need to find out through other narrations. But a Sahabi, even if he was young, he was five, six, he saw Rasulullah just for an hour. We accept any of his statements. This is a rule that I want you to remember because the Sahaba, they are all udul, they are all trustworthy. Why is that? Because Allah Azza wa Jal samawat, Allah Azza wa Jal above the throne and above all the heavens. He mentioned good about Sahaba. 
So who are we to say, oh, let's investigate whether this Sahabi heard from the Prophet, whether Allah mentioned good about them. Allah, he mentioned that they're in Jannah. Allah, he mentioned that. So who are we to say, let's investigate? We, we're not allowed to investigate about Sahaba. This is one of the principle in hadith that I want you to remember that the Sahaba لهم فضل عظيم have a great virtue even if he hasn't had the chance to sit with Rasulullah just meeting him for one hour during the Hajj during the Hajj we mentioned last time how many people made perform Hajj with Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم huh? over oh, over 120,000 they all saw Rasulullah, they all Sahaba. Even if they never يعني, sat with him, they never spoke to him, they are Sahaba. رضي الله وقد نالوا هذا الفضل العظيم. And they have achieved the great virtue of companionship. Sahaba, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned good about them. That is why we need to think good about them. Nu'man ibn Bashir رضي الله عنهما. May Allah be pleased with both of them with him and his father Bashir ibn Sa'ad al-Ansari radiallahu anhu they are all both from Medina he said I have heard the Prophet Sallallahu so this is a hadith this is a hadith he, he, was, he was precise he said Sami'atu which means I heard so here he actually heard when he was young he heard and he memorized so this is a message for the youth the youth when the Sahaba they were young six, seven, eight they memorized from Rasulullah they looked at him and they sat with him, they memorized. Likewise, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah. When the Prophet Islam died, he was only uh, nine, ten years old. <coughs> and he narrated one of the greatest hadith that will come to it, inshallah, hadith number 19 or 20, which is hadith, Ya Ghulam, inni mu'allimuka kalimat, ihfad illaha yahfad. And Ibn Abbas, he memorized. He memorized. He, so this is a message for the youth. Memorize, uh, young, young lads. It's time for you to to step up and think, I've got to memorize. Start with the Quran, okay? And once you finish the Quran, Alhamdulillah, Allah Azza wa blessed you with the hijj of the Quran, memorize the hadith in Arabic. Even if it's, you don't fully understand it, but memorize it. Because it is a way to preserve this religion. This religion, Alhamdulillah, has reached us through memorization. Amen? The hijj the sudur. So it's important for the youth to memorize. It doesn't mean that it's too late for us, you know, old people. No, it's never late. But they use, as you all know, they have fresh memory and their brain is, if you could say, you know, uh, the brain, you know, can grasp easily and memorize easily. That is why it's important for the fathers and mothers to encourage their children to memorize the Quran, memorize the Hadith. Tamam? And don't worry about their career or their future. Allah Azza wa Jal, their future is in between Allah's hand. Their career is between Allah's hand. So you don't have to worry about their future and their career. What you've got to do is you've got to encourage them to memorize the Quran and the Hadith and get them to love the Quran and the Hadith. This Hadith is also one of the important Hadith of Islam. Again, I mentioned earlier, the scholars, they say that Islam evolved about around four or five hadith. One of the four or five hadith is this one. Hadith al niyya it talks about your spirituality and your soul and your hearts, the importance of sincerity. Hadith al-A'mal bin, uh, hadith man amila amalan talk about the standard of your action. Your action, any act of worship, don't worship Allah the way you want to worship. Find out, okay, am I doing right? The way am I worshiping, is it right? Has the Prophet Asim done it? Has the Sahaba done it? Has the Salaf done it? If they did, did it, Alhamdulillah, you're upon the right. If they haven't done it, then do not come up with a new act of worship. This hadith, in a nutshell, talk about how to behave in front of the ambiguous matter, the confusing matters. You're not sure. Is it halal? Is it haram? How to behave toward that? How... Alhamdulillah, in this life, we know that every day we're facing this. Every day, every single day in your transaction, in dealings, in, in, in worship, you always have this question in your head. You, you, you're wondering, is this halal? Is this haram? Am I doing right? Am I doing wrong? This hadith teaches you one simple rule to say that there are three types of people. People who are learning, 
people who don't know and people who are who have learned the learned people tamam people who don't know of course then they need to ask people who are learning we'll talk about that in uh, in a few minutes uh, they they can find out for themselves whether it's halal or haram and the learned people the scholars they need to teach it to people so this hadith show that the halal everyone knows it you don't need to be a scholar for the halal we know that water is halal everyone knows it because it's part of the ni'mah we know that some food are halal like bread like uh, flour like uh, wheat it's halal we know like the livestock the the animal that we eat sheep cow camel chicken we know it's halal i mean of course if we are slaughtered in a right way of course and haram Alhamdulillah, most of Muslims know alcohol is haram, khamar is haram. We know that riba, riba, the, 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 the principle of riba is haram, which is which means interest or, and there's a lot of detail, but just in short, usury. In, in English, it's called usury or usury. This is how they call it. Even in uh, Christianity, this exists. Usury, before they used to basically, they're using the poor people because they are not able to pay in full. They're not able to pay in full. They're using his poverty to pay more because of the delay payment, because of the deferred payment. Tamam? This is called usury in, uh, in, uh, in other religion, and in Islam we call it riba. And um, we know it's haram. We know, example, eating uh, pork is haram. We know that for a fact because Allah mentioned, we know that al mayta Major which is carcass, which is dead, you know, animal that you find on the street or in the desert. You're not allowed to go and, you know, you know cook it. It's haram. It's mayta. Allah made it clear in the Quran. We know that disobeying your parents is haram. It's clear in the Quran. We know that shirk is haram. We know that kufr is haram. It's clear to all of the Muslims. Alhamdulillah, these are part of our faith. But there are things, and those are many. There are things, and those, those things are many, many. We don't know. Is it halal? Is it haram? We don't know. These many things will push you to learn. You need to learn. Don't stay ignorant all your life. You need to learn. And one of the ways to learn is to learn through the learned people, the scholars. And if you have not access, you cannot access one of the scholars, and this is what the hadith is talking about. If you cannot access one of the scholars, you can't ask a scholar, what should you do? The Prophet ﷺ mentioned there are two types of people. Some of the people, they stay away. They say, no, this is ambiguous, confusing. I'm not, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna eat it. Example, horse, eating horse. Is it halal, is it haram? Eating frogs. Eating lizard, eating hyenas, is it halal, is it haram? We don't know. It's confusing for some people. The hadith say that there are two types of people. Some people, they stay away from this. Those who stay away from this, is tabara dinihi wa irdih. What do you say in English? Istabara ali dinihi wa irdih? He is saved, he protected his. Is tabara'a. What's the word? Is tabara'a. He's protected his religion and his family. Yeah, he's protected. Now, is tabara'a mean talab al bara'a. Meaning he's innocent, meaning he has innocented himself, he's protected in his religion and in his honor. Because people will start saying, oh, you eat a lot of horse, why are you, are you like a madman? Or he might say, but yeah, but this madhab, Mathana Imam Malik, he said, it's fine. He might say that, he might, he might. But, you know, what, what we're trying to say here that somebody who's not learned and he has no access to scholars, and that was back then, but now, alhamdulillah, with uh, Sheikh Google, like people say, call it, huh? Sheikh Google, huh? that you can find all the answers possible. But nevertheless, it's best, if you want to be on the safe side, it's best to call a scholar. Alhamdulillah, we have you know, communication, telecommunication. You can always call a scholar, call a talib ilm, somebody who's, who has learned, and ask them, is it halal, is it haram? But let's say you have no access, you're in the middle of the desert, you have no access. Then either you stay away from it, 
And if you do, you are protected in your religion and in your honor. No one will talk behind you. Rather, the people, they say, MashaAllah, that guy is good because he stayed away. Or the other type of people, they actually, you know, do it. They actually come close to this ambiguous matter and start eating and start. Then them, them guys, it's like the one, it's like the sheep try to go around the uh, al hima hima means around the fences you know the sheep if they stay away from the herd and they stay away from from uh, the thing and they get closer to the fences what happened to the wolf or to the uh, whatever eat them well they are more prone and more likely to be attacked by the wolf rather you should stay in the middle you should stay far away from the fences the prophet Aslam gave a educational example here. He said the example of shubuhat is like those fences. These are shubuhat. If you get closer to it, you're about to fall. I want to give you an image, a clear example. What is shubuhat? You get closer, you may fall. You may not fall, nah, you may not fall, but you're more likely to fall. This is the example of the one who doesn't know about this ambiguous matter and what to do. And there is another hadith, inshallah, will come hadith, I think number 26 or 25, where the Prophet asked him, no, before that, 12, uh, ila ma la yaribuk, which means leave what's doubtful and take something that is not doubtful that you're sure about. We'll come, inshallah, about it. This hadith shows that there are many things in religion, many, many things in religion that is not clear cut halal, it's not clear cut haram. Those middle one, ask the scholars, phone them, find out, research, make some research, read. If you're not sure, stay away. Now, does that mean if you don't stay away, you still do it? It's haram. No, it's not haram. But you will, because if you go there, you will probably go to further. Because any ambiguous thing will lead you to, next ambiguous will lead you to ambiguous, will lead you to haram. This is a, this has been experienced, and that is why the scholar they say, leave ambiguous thing, because for every ambiguous thing, it will lead you to haram. One of the ambiguous thing is example, a nabid. اختلف يعني الأحناف they say nabid. Nabid is basically the uh, the dates that are um, fermented, and when it's too fermented way too long, especially in hot country, let's say three, four, five, six months, you start drinking. If you drink a bit, it doesn't intoxicate you. But if you drink a lot, it does intoxicate you. Now the date itself, the date, is it halal or haram? Halal, the dates, dates is halal, there's no problem. But when the date they are fermented and stayed for so long, you drink a little bit, it doesn't intoxicate, but you know by drinking a lot, it will intoxicate you. Now, I'm not talking about drinking a lot, I'm talking about drinking a little bit. Is it halal or haram? I don't know. Is it halal or haram? Well, you start drinking a bit, drinking a bit, drinking a bit, until you don't realize, but you have drunk probably a liter of it, and you will get intoxicated. So the point here is that if you get closer to the ambiguous thing, it will and eventually lead you to haram. And by the way, Nabid, the majority of scholars, they say it's haram. Why? Because there's a qaida, qaida, yani usuliya, wa hiya ma'khudha min al-hadith, ma askara kathiruhu faqaliluhu haram. Whatever intoxicate with a big amount of drink, and whatever is small amount, even if it doesn't intoxicate you, it's haram. Tamam? Here we talk about the ambiguous matter. So the Prophet Sallallahu he gave the example of the shubuhat, like the fences, and he gave the example of the two type of people. The people who try to get closer to the fences, eventually they will, you know, go over these fences and they will fall into haram. But the people who are stay away from the fences, then they will more likely be protected. And he said, those fences, it's like the maharim Allah. Ala wa inna himallahi maharimu. Maharimu means his prohibition. And then he ended sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this is the second part of the hadith is very important where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that in uh, the reason why people get closer to the shubuhat or doesn't get closer to the shubuhat is because of his heart. And he said that in a body 
there's a muscle or there's a piece of uh, meat in the body in which if it's good all of your body will show good will be healthy and good but if it's bad if it's you know like corrupt all your body will show corruption and that piece of meat is the heart so what is the relation between the beginning of the hadith and this one this show that if you want to know a good heart a good heart generally will never go anywhere close to these fences and to this ambiguous matter but this hadith is also important and this is a refutation for so many arguments some of the people will say when you talk to them and say Akhi, you need to pray you know you need to fast they say what what make you know me i may not pray i may not fast but my heart is good i never lie huh? i never steal people i'm sure you heard these things before well this is this argument go against him because if your heart is good this will, this will show in your this will show in your body by you know praying by doing the things that are the most obliga obligatory and compulsory which is the right of allah upon you which is the obligation that toward allah azza wa jal so this hadith shows that the qalb is the asas of kulli shay and likewise some of the scholars they mention uh mashayak they say it's like oranges if you see the 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 top of the oranges kind of you know the al um, qishra do you see al qishra the skin of the orange you see you see it to be dirty you know or you know to be like corrupt you know that inside is not really this is what generally happened but if you see the skin is good that means inside is good likewise with uh, with this hadith Allah wa inna fil jasadi mudha that piece of meat which is the heart if it's good it will show in your body and if it's bad it will also show in your body and of course this hadith excludes the munafiqoon. Munafiqoon, they have the most evil heart ever. But in their soul, they are the most evil people. But in their action, what they do, they, you know, they act to be Muslim and to be loving Islam. But in reality, in their heart, they hate Islam. They are called munafiqoon. That's Allah Azza wa Jalla salama. So this hadith shows that if you have a good and pure heart, normally you will stay away from anything that is ambiguous and if you have a heart that is corrupt you will more likely get closer to the shubuhat and eventually it will fall into haram Allah azza wa jal an yuwafiqana wa iyyakum li kulli khair wa an yuallimana ma ma najhal wallahu alam sallallahu alayhi wa nabiyyina muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi if you have any question regarding this topic inshallah i will uh, take your questions Otherwise, inshallah, we'll let you go, inshallah. Tfadal yeah, uh, Gelatin, for example, there are a lot of ulama, some of them they say it's halal. Gelatin. Gelatin. Well, brother is asking, see, one of the, one of the very common question and contemporary question, gelatin. Is it halal? Is it haram? And this is one, one of the ambiguous matters. And the scholars, they've said, we, we've, we've, asked, we've asked, we've asked different azhar and everything, we've asked scholars of Saudi, they all uh, tend to see the agreement, they all say that if gelatin is not specified, just gelatin, it's not specified, stay away from it, because it could be pork, it could be beef. But if he says beef gelatin, I ask all of them, I even say, but they don't, they don't do the beef and everything, they say, no, this is a completely different topic, they say it's halal. If it's beef gelatin, they say it's halal. Tamam? But to be honest, my heart is not really at peace with beef gelatin. But if you feel like, okay, this color, they say it's halal, halal, take it, it's halal. But gelatin alone, gelatin, not specified, don't take it. Why? Because it could be beef, it could be pork, and stay away from. But if it's pork gelatin, like it's haram. If it's pork, it's haram. See, there are many things, as I said, halal, clear cut, we know, alhamdulillah, haram, we know. But the thing that I'm big with, there are so many. So, this teaches us what? We need to learn. Don't stay ignorant all your life. You need to make research, ask, read. The first ayah that was revealed to Rasulullah was, Iqra, which means, read, learn. Be a learned man. Don't stay ignorant or social media 24-7 or... Read. 
Okay? Uh, I, I haven't seen that there is a plant-based gelatin. Just gelatin, no? It's a, from plant. From plant. I never knew that. I thought gelatin was from the uh, bones. Yani. Allahu alam. If you say gelatin is from plants, then, then this is without that halal. Seeing there might be a type, one type. Allahu alam. Allahu alam. Inshallah, yeah. It's al al khubara wa yani. If you ask the people who know, there might, might be. Allahu alam. I never heard that before. I know gelatin is to do with the bone. Basically, they they uh, they they smash, they smash the bones or and then they make it into jelly and. Allahu alam. Allahu alam. Yes, yes. If he says, nah, I'm good, that's a good thing. If he says gelatin, for example, but then he says at the back, suitable for vegetarian. And of course, without that, this is, inshallah, halal. Because I don't think, especially in the UK with the regulation and laws, because they follow the laws quite good yeah, in the UK. Huh? But uh, Muslim country, Allahu musta'an. Yani when they say suitable for vegetarian, they're not joking around. Because they know that, okay, there has to be suitable for vegetarian. Then yes, Jazakallah khair. Naam. Fadal, Akhi. Fadal, Akhi Muhammad. Yes, um, there's a, you mentioned that, but there's something else I wanted to add. You know, there's a principle I hear them say, where they say, if there's a dog, a dead dog, and it changes, over time it changes, and it's, for instance, it becomes salt. So you no longer can see the dog now, all you can see is salt. Then it's permissible to eat that salt. So they use that argument to say, the gelatin, the form has changed, even if it was pork. But it's changed so much that it's no longer That's the why he mentioned. That's true. Yeah. And that is why the scholar, when I was the scholar, I was shocked myself. They say, no, it's halal because there's a lot of process in the meantime. There's a lot of process going on. So I trust the scholars. The scholars, yeah, and, you know, people come from all over the world and they've been asked this question maybe a hundred of times. They made their own research. So I trust them. I trust them and I made myself my own research a few years back. And indeed, there, there were these things, I can't remember, but there's a lot of process going on and everything. But in a nutshell, if you see suitable for vegetarian beef gelatin, then inshallah, there's no harm, inshallah, inshallah, and Allah knows best. But if your heart is beef gelatin, I don't want it, then stay away. We're not telling you eat by force. No, stay away. Yani. But pork gelatin, don't eat. Haram. Question here. Um, I read somewhere. Not make. Not make itself is haram. What did you say? Not make is a spice. No, not make. It's a not make a. Apparently, if. George Hindi. In large quantities, it The thing is, in, uh, he, he's asking about nutmegs. Now, in the book of fiqh, in the book of fiqh, they mention that nutmeg is haram. <laughs> but now I have a question. You know these nutmegs that they sell in Madison? If you eat a kilo or two, do you really get intoxicated? Because I don't know if they are the same nutmeg. Because in the book of fiqh, they call Joseph, uh, Joseph they, they, they call a name. I can't remember what's the name. But, and then when I went to English or French, I found out it's nutmeg. But I go, hold on, nutmeg. You know, it's true, it's true. Or oh, cashew, you know, cashew. Uh, nah, they, they mention these things. Yani. That is why, yani, yani the thing is, they, they, we have a question to ask is, if you eat a lot, does it really intoxicate? If that's the case, then it's haram. Even if you eat just one grain, it's haram. The thing is, I'm, 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 I find it hard to believe that if you eat a lot of nutmeg, you get drunk. Or you get intoxicated. Not drunk, but intoxicated. That is why, you know, drugs in the Quran, it might not be found that it's haram. But we know it's haram. Okay? It's not, there's no ambiguous. We know it's haram, it's part of the haram because we know if you use a lot of drugs, your mind goes all over the place. It does intoxicate you, that is why it's haram. But not made. Is this the case for not made? No, I mean, you're right. I, I read that a few, few years back when I was in uh, Egypt and I was kind of shocked, yani, but. Um, because I've eaten, sometimes there were times I've eaten a lot of not made. Does it intoxicate you, really? So we need to ask the khubara, let's ask the expert and say, you know these nutmeg, if you do eat a lot, is it true that it intoxicate you, is it? If they say yes, okay. Then if they say no, they say no, there's no, in or there's no intoxicant, we remove all the intoxicant now with the process and Allahu Alam, Allahu Alam. But in the book of fiqh, you're right, they mention nutmeg is haram, but um, Allahu Alam. I have a question related to the first hadith. 
can we apply that to the action of the heart or what did you say? What did you say? Sheikh Musa? He said the, the first yes, hadith. hadith. You can apply that to the, for example, the, to, the, to the innovations in, in Aqidah that some people have. Mm. Okay. Can we apply that to that? Man ahdafa fi amrina ha, that hadith. Hey, can we apply it to the things of belief and actions of the heart? No. The brother is asking, you know, man ahdafa fi amrina. We are talked about actions a lot. But what about beliefs? Is belief included? No. Belief is included without a doubt. There's a lot of belief that unfortunately people you know, have adopted in the past thousand years and uh, the Muslim have adopted and it is again the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. One of the belief is the belief of Qadariya that we mentioned in hadith number two. The belief that Allah does not know anything until something happens. They are the Qadariya. The Prophet said they are the first people, first sect that will emerge in my Ummah. They are called Al Qadariya. They are Majus al Ummah. They are the fire worshipper of this Ummah. Meaning they are not Muslim. And then the second bid'ah is the bid'ah of Khawarij. Khawarij means the rebels. Those who rebel against, uh, against Ali ibn Abi Talib, against Uthman. They, did, they were not happy with their leadership, Uthman. The Prophet says Uthman is the, yani, is the shaheed of our Jannah, of Jannah. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali ibn Sayyidu Shabab Ahl al-Jannah, wa Ibnah and his two sons. And they're not happy with their leadership. And they uh, rebelled against them. And they started killing Sahaba. They hold the belief that if you commit one sin, you're no Muslim anymore. This belief is innovative belief. One it's not part sin. of Ahl al-Sunnah. Hmm? Major, major sin, Zakla. One major sin. One major sin is you're not part of Ahl al-Sunnah. You're not part, a Muslim at all. Allah will not forgive you. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we believe that, no. Major sin, if you commit a major sin and you die upon it, then you are upon a great danger. But does that mean that you go to hellfire forever? No. Maybe Allah, out of mercy, He might forgive you for that major sin that you died upon because you did something good before. Maybe, Allah alam. Okay? And we have the belief of Mu'tazila, we have the belief of Jamiya, we have the belief of Murji'a. There's so many beliefs. But this, with a short reminder, is, is not enough. This needs to be taught in different lessons. In the books of Aqeedah, I don't know if the Mashayikh you know, teach the book of Aqeedah here, they all mention the differences of uh, beliefs between you know, some you know, group and that group and this group and why this belief is wrong. And we mentioned there from the Quran and Sunnah. Tamam? But without that belief, yani, the belief of Shia, the Shia, the Shia people, what they do, you know, how they believe, they believe that all companions are all disbelievers, except for four companions. And the family of the, the companions that are from the family of the Prophet, that's it. And they insult Aisha radiallahu anha, Umm al muminin the mother of the believers, and they insult some of the wives of the Prophet. Like those are believed that exist, they still exist nowadays. And they've been adopted, and they, uh, they, they, they apply it, they, they, they have special du'as in Iran and Iraq, they have special du'as against Aisha. They insult her, they call her names. Allah. May Allah deal with them accordingly. These beliefs exist. Believe of Mu'tazila, the rationalists, they exist. They, they're not like, you know, we say like uh, in Qaradat. In Qaradat means extinct belief. No, the belief, they still exist. We have some traces of them. Murji'a, Irja. We have a lot of Irja nowadays, especially among the, uh, the Ahl Sunnah, Allah al Musta'an. Allah al Musta'an. And Khawarij. Khawarij, those are you not know, like those Qaeda and uh, Daesh, ISIS. They held the belief of Khawarij. Okay, they, 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 if they see any Muslim example not agreeing with them on the matter, they start killing them. And the thing is, this is not, you know, hearsay. When I was in, in Egypt, I've met some Muslims. They, they ran away from ISIS. They say, I, I thought at first that, you know, they, they were good. But they say, no, no, the scholars, they were right. They're actually Khawarij. They're actually, you know, crazy in their mind. They're not good people. And then he showed me that brother, he's a doctor, he's a Russian doctor. He showed me, he said he got shot by one of them because he, 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 he ran away from them in his leg. 
this is real, this is not. You know, when sometimes the scholars, they say ISIS and everything, it's not because they were taken, you know, aside. No, no, this is something to do with Islamically. Islamically, they are wrong. They are on the wrong path. Allah Allah keep us away from these beliefs because these beliefs will lead you at first in the belief and then it will lead you to do actions to start, you know, killing people for religion, to start, you know, you know, blowing yourself up and fear, you know, thinking I'm going to Jannah. Where are the hadith clear? The Prophet ﷺ, he saw a man fighting, or the Sahaba, they saw a man fighting valiantly and courageously in one of the Ghazawat. I think it was one of the Ghazawat uh, Hunayn. And the Sahaba, they say, this man, well, he fights valiantly. The Prophet ﷺ said, Min ahli nar. He's from the people of Al-Fire. Sahaba, they were like, what? He killed so many people because he wasn't fighting with the sincerity, the sincere heart. He just wanted to show off or fighting for revenge or I don't know. And one of the Sahabis said, I'm, I started to follow him and be behind him. And then I saw that the last, deed he did, uh, the last thing he did, somebody basically struck him into the thing and he couldn't bear the pain. He killed himself. It was suicide. It wasn't, he wasn't killed in the battle. He was suicide. He committed suicide. And then he went back to the Sahaba to prophesy and said, Wallah, now, you know, I have I testified that you are truly a true prophet. Because I have seen with my own eyes that that person killed himself. I'm trying to say that the, some people, they carry this belief, but then in the end, they will act. That is why it is upon, it, it is wajib upon us to warn against this belief. Especially the youth. Now with the social media widespread, a lot of you, they get influenced by these social media and they get emotional. Look at Yemen, look at this, Syria, Nam. It's very, very sad. We live in a sad world, unfortunately. I mean, when you come to Muslim. But don't let this emotion basically overpower your, uh, and overcome your, your way to think. Islam, alhamdulillah, Islam is clear. Yani we have scholars, we have leaders, we have people in the army. They know what they're doing. We have politicians. They know what they're doing. If they don't, then we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to, you know, to, to yaslah al-ahwal, mean to rectify the affairs. Wallahu al -musta'ana. I know I've been talking a lot and my apology for this. But inshallah we'll end the lesson now. Wallahu alam wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.